Today, I will continue my observations of drugs I stumbled upon while living in New York. The subject of today's video is Kratom or Kratom, a drug that is relatively freely available in many states. Stay tuned and I will offer my pharmacologist's perspective on the complex profile of effects that Kratom can have. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala and I'm a neuropharmacologist studying the mechanisms of drug action in the brain. The subject of today's video is Kratom. Kratom is a herbal supplement that consists of the plant Mitraduna speciosa. It's a plant that has been used traditionally for centuries in southeastern Asia. Generally, its use has revolved around its stimulatory or analgesic effects. Many in the United States use it for self-treating pain, mood disorders or withdrawal symptoms from opioid use. Now, similarly to the cannabis plant, the kratom plant has a number of molecules that can all have their pharmacological effects. For cannabis, the main psychoactive component is delta-9 THC, but there are also many other cannabinoids and compounds that may contribute to the end result. In the case of kratom, mitraginine and 7-hydroxymitraginine or 7-HMG are considered to be the main pharmacologically active compounds. Dried leaves have a total alkaloid content of around 0.5 to 1.5 percent. And out of that, the majority is composed of mitraginine. However, there are significant differences in the alkaloid profiles of different varieties. This is also the case for plants subjected to different environments and harvesting times. For example, one study reported that commercial products contain 1 to 6% of mitraginine and 0.01 to 0.04% of 7-HMG. Both of the main psychoactive components bind to the mu opioid receptor with a nanomolar affinity and act as partial agonists. There are also weak agonists at kappa and delta opioid receptors. Mu receptors are the primary opioid receptors responsible for the effects of drugs like heroin and morphine. Notably, 7-HMG has a much greater affinity at the mu opioid receptor compared to mitraginine. Despite activating opioid receptors, these indole alkaloids are pharmacologically and structurally quite distinct from traditional opioids. Indeed, they have been described as atypical opioids to separate them from drugs like morphine, semi-synthetic opioids and endogenous ligands. In recent decades, pharmacology has advanced from the receptor and cell membrane to more closely look at the events happening downstream in intracellular signaling pathways. When opioid drugs bind to opioid receptors, they initiate what is called G-protein coupled or GPCR signaling mechanisms. Some studies suggest that in contrast to traditional opioids, the indole alkaloids contained in the kratom plant would activate GPCRs without initiating the beta arrestin pathway, a phenomenon known as biased agonism. Essentially what this means is that a single receptor can trigger multiple intracellular signaling mechanisms depending on the interacting partners. The beta arresting pathway has been considered responsible for many of the traditional opioid side effects like constipation, sedation and respiratory depression, suggesting that kratom alkaloids could perhaps lack some of the traditional opioid effects. However, it must be mentioned that some of the more recent studies have questioned the role of the beta arresting pathway in the development of these effects. Indeed, the complexity of opioid receptor signaling is an active field of research 
and there is still much more to be known about the precise signaling mechanisms related to these receptors. So, one could say that most of the effects of Kratom are mediated through opioid receptors. But, for example, the analgesic effects of mitrogenine may be complemented by other mechanisms beyond opioid receptors. Indeed, mitrogenine has been reported to activate alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, while other effects could rise through calcium channels or anti-inflammatory mechanisms, and so on. The pharmacokinetic profile hasn't really been fully elucidated, but the metabolism is known to be primarily hepatic, involving cytochrome P450 enzymes, namely CYP3A4, 2D6 and 2C9. The half-life of mitrogenine has been reported to be around 3 hours, however more longer estimates have also been reported. There is some evidence that kratom alkaloids can inhibit hepatic enzymes involved in drug metabolism, which could produce adverse interactions when co-administered with other drugs. One advancement in understanding the effects of kratom has come from studies investigating the metabolism of mitrogenine into 7-HMG in vivo. It has been suggested that 7-HMG is actually the active metabolite of mitrogenine, accounting for most or all of the effects attributed to mitrogenine. Indeed, the metabolized amounts of 7-HMG are much greater than the amounts of 7-HMG present in the plant to begin with. This metabolic activation via CYP3A4 would closely resemble that of opioids like codeine, which is converted into morphine by CYP2D6. So, how do people take Kratom and what does it do? Kratom is almost always consumed orally as a ground powder or mixed in as a tea. It produces a physiological effects similar to opioids, including pain relief and euphoria, but also has a stimulatory component. There aren't any clear-cut lines on how different dosages work, but the general perspective is that Kratom produces different effects at low and high doses. Low doses of Kratom tend to produce more stimulatory outcomes, while high doses of Kratom tend to produce more sedation. Most common adverse effects include agitation, tachycardia, drowsiness and vomiting. In some cases, seizures, severe withdrawal symptoms and hallucinations have been reported. There are also case reports where Kratom combined with other drugs affecting the central nervous system have led to death. However, in most cases where Kratom is consumed orally at low doses or as a traditional tea, it appears to be relatively safe. Then again, there are reports of withdrawal and neonatal abstinence syndrome, which means that when pregnant mothers are consuming a drug, most often an opioid, the baby will experience withdrawal symptoms upon birth. So is Kratom safe to consume? I'd say that if you know the source and purity of the Kratom you're consuming, uh, enjoying a cup of Kratom tea once a week shouldn't be a really big health concern. But in general, using large doses chronically can pose a health risk. As it currently is a non-regulated herbal supplement, there are many issues that could rise from the manufacturing process itself. There have also been reports of tainted batches, high levels of heavy metals and so on with certain brands of Kratom. Again, selling Kratom is a large business and without regulation, many suppliers lack the incentive to spend money on quality control and quality ingredients. Again, I do not wish to promote drug use of any kind, but if you intend to try it out nevertheless, I would suggest you stick to low doses and only occasional use. Of course, one way to look at the use of Kratom is to think it from the perspective of opioid use. There are hundreds of thousands of people who have died of opioid poisoning. In this context, one could argue that Kratom may have a potential role as a harm reduction agent. Some users may, for example, seek Kratom to support their opioid use 
uh, since traditional opioids have become more scarce. Others seek it for self-medicating chronic pain or opioid withdrawal, and it has also been heralded as a legal, inexpensive alternative to opioid replacement regimens. However, the use of kratom in this context remains a matter of debate, and there is limited evidence to support these claims. That's pretty much all for today. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to leave a comment down below. Also, remember to press like and subscribe to my channel for future neuropharmacology content. Thank you for watching and until next time.